Thanks, man. <laughs> if you're seven or 81, you're, you're just out of luck. <laughs> I like the, Gil Penalos is an amazing guy, and the 880 thing is a, is a great concept because it, 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 it puts everything in a context. Uh, hello, it's really, really nice to be here. Um, this week is, uh, is the last week of book tour for me. And um, I, I'm, I'm excited to be here, not only because we got five inches of snow on Sunday, and it is very nice to be, any, anytime they say you wanna go uh, south in uh, November, December, January, February, it's like, yes, immediately, yes. So it's nice to be here. It's also nice to be in, in Tucson. I, I've never been here before. Um, I have been to Phoenix, I have been north of Phoenix. Uh, I've never been to Tucson, so this is new for me. It is gorgeous. You live in a very beautiful place, and I understand why you live here. Uh, let's talk transportation, and let's talk about how we can uh, make it better. Um, if you listen to the debate we're having over transportation in this country, uh, it's all around the idea of needing to get more money to do more stuff. We have all of these things that we wanna do. We wanna make repairs to our existing system. We've got safety improvements we wanna make. Uh, we've gotta fight and deal with congestion. We wanna invest for growth. But we just don't have enough money to do all this stuff. We have these generations of people. Uh, we have this retiring or near retired generation. Uh, we have this generation of young people that are baffling at times. We, we, we look at these two generations and they seem to, they're huge. There's a lot of people in these generations and they seem to want something fundamentally different about transportation systems than they wanted even two decades ago. We would love to provide those things. We just, we just don't have the money to do it. We would like to make lots of investments in, in biking and walking and rail and bus. We would love to do all these things, but gosh, we just don't have the money to do all the stuff we wanna do. What, what is the obvious answer to these problems? Yeah, we just need more money. And if you, if you look at the conversation that we have about transportation, everywhere in this country, it's all about how do we get more money to continue to do the stuff that we're doing and more stuff. A few years ago, the American Society of Civil Engineers put out a report. And let, let, let's pause here for a sec. The American Society of Civil Engineers is like the premier uh, advocacy organization around uh, infrastructure, transportation. They're kind of the go-to organization. Every time you hear a discussion of infrastructure or transportation investment, uh, it's likely to have a quote from someone from the American Society of Civil Engineers. They put out a report that said, in order to maintain our existing transportation system at what they call the minimum tolerable condition, so this is not building a bunch of new stuff, this is not like, this is what they call minimum tolerable condition, would take $94 billion more spending every year. Let me give you some context for that. Uh, right now, the federal gas tax sits at a little over 18 cents a gallon. It's not been raised since 1993. If, if you remember way, way back when we used to pay for things, when we would spend, uh, there was this, <laughs> you got that as a joke? <laughs> it was like two years ago. Um, Remember when we used to pay for things, there was a conversation that, that we were having about how to pay for transportation, where we were going to raise the gas tax to meet uh, the demands that we have for more transportation funding. Um, there was the discussion about actually indexing the gas tax to inflation. So hasn't been raised since 1993, let's index it to inflation from that point, and we would have a gas tax today of around 30 cents a gallon. For context, uh, just so you can kind of see where we sit in this system. Uh, we said, what if we indexed it to growth in the economy? There's this idea that we invest in transportation to create growth. If we indexed it to growth from 1993, we would have a gas tax of around 30 cents a gallon. What if we indexed it to traffic growth? So traffic has continued to grow and expand. There's more people driving today, more miles than there's ever been before. What would that mean if we indexed it to traffic? It would mean a gas tax of around, what was it, 24 cents a gallon. But what if we uh, raise the gas tax enough to get that $94 billion a year that the American Society of Civil Engineers said we would need to just maintain what we have at a minimum tolerable condition? That would mean a gas tax of around 78 cents a gallon. Just so we're clear, that's a static number. 
So everybody here understands that if you raise the gas tax to 78 cents a gallon, people would drive less. If you're trying to get the same amount of money, that means you'd have to raise the tax even more. People would drive even less. Uh, I saw a thing where they had run this analysis dynamically in Wisconsin. Uh, it was never published, but I got a, I got a, a, a little snippet of it. Uh, in Wisconsin, they figured that they would need an infinite gas tax with nobody driving. In other words, there was not a point where they could actually make the math on this work. In that same report, the American Society of Civil Engineers said, if we uh, fail to make proper investments in transportation infrastructure, uh, families and businesses will suffer a trillion dollars of losses over the next decade. In order to avoid that trillion dollars of loss, the American Society of Civil Engineers recommends that we spend $220 billion a year for the next decade or $2.2 trillion. The same report said, uh, if we fail to make the proper investments in transportation, our economy will grow slower than it otherwise would. And that slower rate of growth will mean that the federal treasury will not collect over the next three decades, $540 billion of revenue. In order to avoid that $540 billion loss, the American Society of Civil Engineers recommends that the U.S. taxpayers spend $6.6 .6 trillion on transportation. This is always the point in the presentation where people start to get skeptical. Because they look at this and they say, this is insane, Chuck. Like, no one, this is, nothing's this crazy. No one would publish a report that says this. Oh, oh yes, they did. Um, let me give you a, a, a little insight on how insane our transportation system has become. This is Highway 91 in California. Uh, we just have completed a project, $1.4 billion, where we added some additional lanes to this heavily congested highway. Here's how this project was described in the local paper. Uh, the project will give some relief to drivers in the regular lanes, raising their average rush hour speeds from eight miles an hour to 9.4 miles an hour. Nobody's life is any better because they can commute at 9.4 miles an hour instead of eight miles an hour. But I wanna give you a little insight on how insane the finances of our transportation system is. Because this project was $1.4 billion. Yet, if you look at what happened, you saved each of those drivers about 25 seconds on their commute. 25 seconds times 200,000 cars a day, times 365 days a year, times 50 years that that lane will be there times $30 an hour, which is the typical uh, salary and benefit of a Southern California resident. And all of a sudden, that 25 cents worth of time for a $1.4 billion project is saving us $10 billion of lost time. That's the math that we use to not only justify that project, but almost every project that we're doing today, including that one that just went by. We have created this system uh, that has gone uh, off the deep end in terms of its internal finances. We just passed this last week the president's, uh, um, excuse me, it wasn't the, the bipartisan infrastructure compromise. Let me take you back to last March when the president released his bill. And, and I'm gonna say something here, and I'm saying this in a nonpartisan way. I'm giving you the numbers. My beef here is not with one party or another. It's with a, a very top-down transportation system. The president's plan when it came out in March, the American Jobs Plan, uh, there was one very notable thing about it that both of our two major parties agreed with. And that was that it was a huge plan. It was a big number, it was bold. Trillions and trillions of dollars to be spent on infrastructure. The Democrats' marketing material was that this is a big investment, a catch-up investment on infrastructure. The Republicans' uh, response was, this is really, really big, this is huge, this is recklessly big. Everybody agreed that the number was big, right? In the American Jobs Plan, uh, the administration identified 170,000 miles of federally funded road that is in poor condition right now today. Of that 170,000 miles in poor condition, the plan that the president released last March would fix 13% of them over the next decade. In the American Jobs Plan, uh, the administration identified 45,000 bridges that are in a serious state of disrepair. Over the next decade, the American Jobs Plan, this big massive number, would maintain of those 45,000 bridges, only 10,000 of them. 
So let me summarize. Big, huge number only maintains a tiny percentage of the stuff that is already in bad condition over the next decade. And what happened to that number over the last six months? That got whittled down and whittled down and whittled down. We have no serious approach to maintaining our infrastructure. Not at the city level, not at the state level, not at the national level. We have no serious approach at all. Not only are we not going to raise gas tax to 78 cents a gallon for the minimum tolerable condition, we're not gonna even come close to that. And so this idea of we need more money needs to be looked at for the absurdity that it is. And we have to actually ask a different question, a more sophisticated question. We, at the local level, need to ask, if we can't get the money, what then? <laughs> when I was in the Army, I was at Fort Dix, New Jersey, and the drill sergeants would stand up and yell. And then it was right across the street was an Air Force base. I can't remember which one. Maybe somebody knows. Uh, which one? Lakeland. I, really, I didn't know that. So right across the street, and the drill sergeants, you know, big, loud, booming voices, and then they would have to stop because it was so loud. And then they would pause, and then the plane would go by, and then they would keep going. The question we need to struggle with is, if we can't get the money, what then? I want to... I want to pause and have you think about why we have the transportation system we do. Because we were trying to solve a very uh, unique problem, one that I, I think we don't fully appreciate today. Um, after World War II, we were trying to solve the problem of the Great Depression. My grandfather was a, a Marine in World War II. He was uh, the first wave into Nagasaki after they dropped the bomb. So that gives you a sense of his age. Uh, he grew up in the Great Depression. Um, I remember talking to him about it, and, and there was this sense of how difficult a time this was, how bewildering this was. I, I think one of the most disorienting things about the Great Depression is that no one really understood what caused it. Y you can even read economists today, and they debate over what caused it. You can read one, and, and, and they'll have a full explanation, you'll be like, that makes a lot of sense, and then you'll read another one with a full explanation that's the exact opposite, and you're like, well, that makes a lot of sense too. Nobody really understood what caused it. We still don't. Even more disorienting, no one understood how to get out of the Great Depression. The whole New Deal project was an attempt to just try a bunch of different stuff and see if any of it would get us out of this uh, deep economic uh, hole we were in. What we are taught in school today, in middle school, uh, in high school, is that uh, the thing that got us out of the Great Depression was World War II, right? And, and, and it's funny because it's so reflexively automatic to us, like this is, this is how you get out of the depression, you start a global war. Um, you know, as if like that's a really good thing, right? We take millions of working age people, we ship them off overseas to kill and to die. We take millions of other people out of productive types of things and we put them to work building all the implements of war, the ships, the tanks, the planes, the munitions. We ration sugar, we ration butter, we ration gasoline. Th this is not what prosperity looks like, right? But if you are a, a spreadsheet person in Washington, D.C., all of a sudden, the Great Depression was over, right? Growth was back. Towards the end of the war, the economists around FDR started to freak out because they recognized, they understood that uh, this stimulus was a temporary thing. The war needed to end. And when the war ended, we were gonna shut down all these industries, we were gonna bring back all these troops, and our economy was gonna go right back to where it was before the war started. We were gonna be right back to 1935 and the Great Depression. Everybody here knows that that's not what happened, right? What happened is that we kicked off two decades of the most robust growth that any economy has ever experienced, the broadest, uh, you know, most, most uh, successful period of growth that any nation has ever experienced. We, we nostalgize it today, right? It's this, the two decades of this greatness. We, the, the American dream came out of this, this whole concept of, of owning your own home. How did we do this? 
we, we, we did it by solving this problem of the Great Depression. We, 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 we were the last major industrial power not decimated by war. Um, we literally had the gold, right? We had everybody else's gold either because we sold them stuff and they had to give us their gold or they decided to store their gold here because it wasn't safe where they were. Uh, we had more oil coming out of the ground than Saudi Arabia. We were the world's reserve currency. We, we had a nation that had been united culturally against common enemies. There was a closeness and a bond that we had, a trust that we had for each other. And we took all of this capacity and all this might and we put it into solving that problem. How do we keep our economy from going back into depression? We started to build interstates. We invested in infrastructure. We turned our cities into kinetic growth machines, getting people into homes, into businesses, building, 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 building. And that kept us out of the Great Depression. And if you look at it, if, if you just sit in Washington, D.C. or on Wall Street and look at the flow of capital in our economy, it all looks really good, right? It's all trending in the right direction. But if you're a city, if you're a local leader, every one of those new developments, every one of those new roads, every one of those new pipes, every one of those new things going in represents to you a transaction that creates growth, but it also represents to you a liability, something that you have to come back and take care of later a road you have to fix, a pipe you have to maintain, a pump you have to take care of and replace. What we look at now today, after seven decades, is that we have a very different problem to solve. Our problem is not, how do we keep growing enough to stay out of the depression? That's the problem we're trying to solve, but that's not our problem. Our problem is, how do we make use of all this stuff that we've built? How do we make productive use of everything that we have put in the ground? Tucson is a beautiful city, and, and, and we can look around at the natural beauty here and be stunned and amazed by it. Um, I, I, it's striking in many ways. But I'm also saddened when I go around because I'm driving on some of the, the biggest investments that you can make in transportation. These wide six lane roadways with a, a center turn lane down the middle, and there's nothing along it for mile after mile after mile after mile. Massive investments with no return. That's our problem today. Our problem is not how do we build that next mile? Our problem is how do we make use of what we have already built? To do that, we have to think differently about our transportation system. So what I wanna do is I wanna disassemble for you the way we set up our system today so that we can reimagine it and start doing something different with those parts. Let's start with this the hierarchical road network. Uh, this is a, a kid's drawing. It's a kid's drawing of something that we, we all intuitively grasp, right? Uh, little local streets go into collector streets, go into arterial streets, go into uh, major arterials, interstates. You go, you go from small to large. This is how our transportation system works. Nobody has to be told this because we've all grown up with this. We all understand how this functions. I want you to think of a watershed and we can do this very easily in, in Minnesota. Down here, it's a little bit different. Uh, you, you tend to have different types of rain events than we do. But I think you can all play along with me and understand what I'm talking about here. In, in, a, in a watershed, we recognize that uh, little ditches and creeks will flow into brooks and streams. They will flow into rivers, flow into to major rivers that come together to form major tributaries. Again, go from small to large. We also recognize that if we get rain out here on the periphery of the watershed, if that rain is intense enough or persistent enough, that what will happen is that all that water will accumulate and create a flood. We completely understand this. This is Hydrology 101. I took Hydrology 101. They spent about five minutes on this concept because it's very simple, everybody understands it. But for some reason, when you leave Hydrology 101, and you walk across the street to Traffic 101, this idea that, uh, you know, small will run into a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. When you get a little bit of action out on the edge, that action accumulates and creates a flood. is somehow difficult for us to grasp. If you set out to design a system that generated the maximum amount of congestion possible, this is what it would look like. 
it would look like the exact system we have created. We literally manufacture a flood every single day. And this is why congestion is a ubiquitous condition of the North American development pattern. Every city, regardless of size, has overwhelming levels of congestion. Tucson has overwhelming levels of congestion. Phoenix has overwhelming levels of congestion. I was in Newark last night, overwhelming levels of congestion. I'm gonna go back to my hometown of Brainerd, Minnesota, population 14,000. And if we go out to the stoplight in the middle of town at 7.50 a.m. any weekday morning and ask the person in their car, what do you think about the traffic congestion here? They'll say, oh my gosh, it's horrible, it's overwhelming. And 10 minutes later, there will be no cars there. We create the maximum amount of congestion possible everywhere where this system is deployed in this way. And the irony is that we respond to it by systematically overbuilding. We overdesign and overengineer everything throughout our system. I did a little TV interview earlier today and he was asking me questions about uh, road rage and, and, and aggressive driving. And I'm like, my gosh, you've overbuilt and overdesigned everything, everything. Um, we do this in, in a sense, uh, engineers call this a conservative design. And that was very odd for me in my early years of engineering because I thought to be conservative meant to kind of hedge, you know, not go all in, maybe take little incremental steps. But no, conservative when it comes to street design means overbuild in case you someday will need that capacity. And so what happens is that if you go to the point of peak congestion, that period of time when you have a flood in your system and you, you can go up and like look at what it looks like, you will see tiny parts of your system that are flooded and the vast majority of pavement that you have paid for, the vast majority of transportation investment you have made is completely un unutilized. That is not an optimized system. That is not an efficient system, yet that is a system that we have built. We've done this on the backs of this design approach that used to be called forgiving design. It's now just called design. Um, it, it, it's funny because I talk about forgiving design. Uh, I realized that I was never taught it as forgiving. I was just taught it as like the process. You actually have to go back in the literature to find the word forgiving. Think about the very early days of highway building. What you had was the, the old cart paths converted into high performance roadways. And so what, what happened when you're driving a, a, a cart pulled by some horses and you come across a, a big rock or a big tree or a gully, what would you do? You would just go around, right? There's no sense in leveling that out and clearing that out. So in the early days of the automobile, what happened is they would go out on these wagon trails and they would put in a high performance surface. They'd throw some gravel down and then along would come a car and it would come up to one of those corners and people would go off, they would hit things and they would die. Engineers came up with this idea of forgiving design to solve that problem. And it, it is a genius insight. It recognizes human nature and it says, we realize that humans are fallible and humans are going to make mistakes. We can look at the mistakes that humans commonly make and we can incorporate into our design compensation for those mistakes. We can forgive the mistakes that drivers make within our design. This is absolutely genius. Let me, let me show you how this works. We've got a two lane roadway and we understand that sometimes a driver it is going to float a little bit in their lane for whatever reason. Um, and we don't want them to float across the middle of the, the, the lane and, and hit an oncoming vehicle. So what we do is we widen out those lanes and give them a little bit more room, a little bit more room to maneuver. We recognize that sometimes drivers, uh, for whatever reason, uh, are going to go off the side of the road. They're, they're, they're gonna go out of their lane, off the edge of the road. We don't want that to wind up in the ditch or wind up getting pulled off the edge. So what we do is we create a, a little bit of recovery area, we call it. A little bit of room on the edge for them to recover if they do happen to go off that lane. Then we recognize that sometimes drivers will exit the roadway completely. Uh, they will be going uh, uh, you know, off the road uh, with, with you know, a lot of speed, a lot of kinetic energy. We want that kinetic energy to be dissipated before they run into something that won't move. 
And so what we do is we remove the obstacles and we create a clear zone. And now you have a forgiving design. You, you, the, there's a little bit of laughter here, but I, I, wanna, I wanna just reiterate, this is actually genius. Because it, it acknowledges that humans make mistakes and that we can, through our design, compensate for those mistakes. And, and, and let's be clear too, if we, if we look at today, there will be roughly this year 40,000 people killed on America's transportation system in 2021. That's an appalling number. But if we had the same rate of death per mile traveled as they had in 1935 today, you would have over half a million people killed on our roadways. Forgiving design has saved millions and millions of lives. This is a genius idea. What's the, what's, what's the problem with this idea? And I think this gets at why people were laughing a little bit. Because we, we understand, right, that on the open road, this is a brilliant way to design. But when we bring this into our urban areas, when we bring this into our cities, when we add complexity into this environment, we get all kinds of tragedy. What we do is we signal to drivers, we've got your back. We've forgiven your mistakes. We've taken care of stuff that we've given you a big margin for error. And so what happens is that speeds go way up and it mixes with that complexity and we get increasing levels of tragedy. This really gets at this idea that there is a difference between a road and a street. There's a difference between trying to get somewhere and trying to be somewhere. There's a difference between the open road and the places where we're trying to be as human beings outside of a vehicle. Um, and the sad tragedy of the engineering profession is that in trying to solve that original problem, how do we stay out of the depression? We never had a conversation and we have never had a conversation about what it means to actually build a place. This is the manual and uniform traffic control devices. In, in, in the profession, we call this the MUT or the MUT CD. Uh, this is the manual that is used to uh, design uh, the traffic control devices on, on every street in this city and every street in North America. This is a ubiquitously used book. If you go to this book and you query, all right, what is a street? And how is a street different than say, the design of a highway? Quite literally, if you look up the definition of a street, it will say, street, see highway. The book has zero discernment the code book that was used to design this street out here and that street out there and the street out in front of your house has zero discernment between the local street that you live on and the interstate highway that will travel from here to Phoenix. That is deeply, deeply wrong. One of the manifestations of this, uh, it comes in, in terms of uh, speeding and the way we react to speeding. And again here, I, I wanna take a moment and talk about what I think is a set of genius insights that engineers have had that have been applied in a very limited way where like forgiving design, if they expanded the knowledge and understanding uh, would come out differently. Um, what engineers have long recognized to the frustration of many bike walk advocates is that driving is what cognitive psychologists call a system one activity. If you have ever read a book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, an amazing book, I highly recommend it. Daniel Kahneman describes two systems that are used for human cognition. Th this is not the involuntary system that you know, powers your heart and, and your lungs, reminds you to breathe. This is the way you think. So if I ask you, what is one plus one? Everybody knows the answer to that is two. And you don't have to dig real deeply. You don't have to push other things out of your brain in order to come up with that answer. It's very automatic. That is called system one. If I ask you to add two four digit numbers, some of you freaks could probably do that. Like I've run into people who are like, ah, I can do that. I can't. If I'm gonna do that, I have to concentrate. If you don't give me a pen and paper, and even if you do, I have to concentrate, push other things out of my brain and focus on those four digit numbers, carry the one, do all that. That is system two. 
System two requires focus and requires you to remove other things from your consciousness stream in order to do it. Here's the insight from the engineering profession. Driving is a system one activity. I know a lot of bike walk advocates don't want it to be. They want it to be a system two activity, but it isn't, it's a system one activity. And it has to be a system one activity because otherwise humans could not do it. The humans who can do system two for a long period of time, those are race car drivers and jet fighter pilots. The rest of us have to be in system one because system two is exhausting. It is really taxing. You know how you take that test and then you're wiped out at the end? That's because it is exhausting to use your brain in that way. So when you drive, everybody drives most of the time in system one. And in system one, you can sing along with the song on the radio, listen to the news, think about what's going on with your kids, talk to the person in the seat next to you. That's all very human. That all happens while good, decent, you know, people of integrity are driving because you're driving in system one. And when you pull into that parking lot and the person sitting next to you is having a conversation with you, what will happen? The conversation will stop. And not only will it stop because you are now focused because a parking lot is a more complex environment with all kinds of things going on. You're now focused for a very brief period of time on that complexity. You go into system two, but the person in the passenger seat who's talking to you, they don't keep talking either because they know you're not paying attention because they understand the environment that you're in. Okay, so how do we respond to speeding? We respond to it in two ways. The engineers have it right when it comes to the open road. Because when we get speeding on the open road, engineers will go out and they'll do a speed study. And they will ask the question, are people going over the speed limit? When the answer to that question is yes, they raise the speed limit. People get angry, they get mad. They go, oh no, we want lower speed limits, lower speed limits. What happens when you lower speed limits is that some people will force themselves to drive at that low speed. Most people, most people will drive above the speed limit. And when you get that speed differential, that's when you start to get crashes. That's when you start to get a dangerous situation. And so what engineers wanna do is keep traffic flowing and so they'll say, no, we have to raise the speed limit so that the typical driver, they call it the 85th percentile speed, most people are driving at that speed or, or slightly below. That is a safe speed. And that is the correct answer for the open road. The problem is when we get into our streets, when we get into our urban areas, we get into that place where we have all of this complexity. Because when we go out there and we look and we see what's going on and we say, okay, are people driving too fast? The answer is yes. Then the response is not to raise the speed limit. The response is to recognize that the street is sending the wrong signals to drivers. And we actually need to redesign the street. We need to signal to drivers the right speed to drive. Now, how would we do that? Go back to the idea of forgiving design, right? We widen out the lanes, we give recovery area, we create clear zones. We signal to drivers that we've got your back, right? We get you covered, we've created all kinds of room for error for you. If we want drivers to slow down, what do we do? We do the exact opposite, right? We narrow up lanes, we reduce the recovery area, we bring the trees back in, we, we, we create edge friction on the side of the road. We actually want drivers to feel uncomfortable when they're driving at speeds that are dangerous speeds. We've got a saying at Strong Towns, uh, if you need a sign to tell people to slow down, you designed your street wrong. We should be able to go out and measure neighborhood speeds in neighborhoods. And if people are driving above neighborhood speeds within that neighborhood, we, we have the wrong design. We have actually built our street wrong. Sometimes that all rubs people the wrong way because they think there's human agency here and there is human agency here. But the reality is I drove here today on streets that were marked 45 miles an hour. And I tell you what, nobody was driving 45 miles an hour and nobody was driving 45 miles an hour. And so unless we are going to say everybody we know is a deviant, 
we, we have to look at some other cause. And the other cause is very clear. We apply highway standards to our neighborhood streets and we get highway results. If you go to any uh, engineering manual, you're gonna see a diagram that looks something like this. And uh, I apologize to everybody. I, I, do, I, I do have an engineering license. I kind of have a, a rider in that license that I have to show you at least two charts in every presentation. So I'm gonna show you two charts now. Um, I had someone complain a couple of presentations ago, like, I don't get your charts. Okay. <laughs> I like charts. I'm an engineer. Stick with me here. This is a very simple one. If you look here, uh, you've got the hierarchical road network on the side here. Local streets, collector streets, arterial streets. Um, and then in the chart itself, you've got this trade-off that's represented between what they call mobility and land access. I think to simplify it down, we can think of it as getting to a place and being in a place. So if you are on an arterial, you have a lot of mobility. You can really get somewhere quickly, but there's not going to be much of a place there. There's not going to be a lot of building along an arterial, as there shouldn't be. If you're going to be on a local street, you can get a lot of access. There's a lot of stuff that we build on local streets, but not a lot of mobility. You're not going very fast in that place. You're not getting anywhere very quickly. But then there's this magic area, this magic zone. <laughs> we just call this Tucson right here. Collectors, where you can have your cake and eat it too. You can both be in a place and drive quickly through a place at the same time. From a strong town standpoint, we clearly understand that we can make great investments in roads to move people across regions very, very quickly and have those pay off in a, in, a, in a major way. We can also build great streets and have those streets create lots of wealth and lots of private investment and lots of return for the community. We can make these investments and have them pay off. But it's these investments here that are bankrupting us. When we go back to that original question, how do we get more money? It's these investments that we are largely building today, this stuff in the middle. And it is really, really expensive, and it has a negative return on that investment. We get poorer every time we build another one of these. And you are building miles of them every year. At the same time, what we recognize is that the two ends here are really, really safe. Interstates are ridiculously safe per mile traveled. The death rates on interstates are really, really low, incredibly low. When we look at local streets, we also see that the death rate, the fatality rate, the traumatic injury rate is again, really, really low. There's a lot of crashes that happen on local streets, but they tend to be fender benders. They tend to be Nick doors. They tend to be, you know, small claims kind of stuff. Almost all of our death, almost all of our traumatic injury is happening in this area right here. This area where you are combining high speeds with complexity. You're combining speeds that are lethal with traffic that randomly turns, crosses, stops, parks, people on bikes, people in wheelchairs, people walking, the dog running out across the street, the kid chasing after the kickball. This is where statistically you have all of the tragedy because you're combining two things that don't go together. This is the second chart, last chart I promise. If you take this diagram and you flip it on its side, and what I've done here is I've said, speed here on the horizontal axis and value this way. So at what speed do we create the most value? And what we see is that we create the most value when we're building really, really slow streets that can create great places with lots of private investment, lots of wealth creation, lots of prosperity, or when we are creating great roads that connect places over distance. Because when we connect places with a great road, we actually improve the value of each place we connect. It's this area in the middle, this area where we're neither in a place nor getting anywhere quickly, that we spend the most amount of money and get the lowest value for our investments. This is something that we call a strode. A strode is the futon of transportation. 
if you think of a futon as an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed, a strode tries to be both street and road simultaneously and it, it fails at both. Let's talk about the difference. A, a, a road we can think of as a replacement of the railroad, which as the name suggests is a road on rails, right? And in a railroad, what do you do? You get on at one spot, you get off at another spot, and there's a high-speed connection between the two. We don't have frontage railroads, we don't have drive-through railroads, it's just a high-speed connection. If you look at this strode, what you see is that we've made a huge investment at moving vehicles quickly, getting from one place to another very fast. There's one, two, three, four lanes, they're highway scale, they're very wide, wide lanes for giving design. We have a center turn lane here that's designed to get those turning vehicles out of the way so the through traffic can speed right through. We've made massive investments to move traffic quickly. Does the traffic get to move quickly here? No, of course not. We have low speed limits, we have random stuff going on, and, and we have traffic signals that literally make people go zero for extended periods of time. And so even though we've made this massive investment in mobility, we have no mobility. What is a street? A street is, and always has been, a platform for building wealth in a place. It is a platform for creating a place. If we look at this street, we have tried to make this a street for building wealth. We put in wide sidewalks, there's decorative lights, uh, they put out banners and benches and all that stuff. Are we building any wealth along this street? No. Because everybody knows if you're shopping here and you want to go shop over here, no one's going to walk across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lanes. No one's going to go down, stand here at the light, walk across, go back. What do they do? They get in their car, they whip a U-turn, and they come around and go shopping. Quite literally, that's what they do. And every business knows that. So every business provides uh, ample parking, a drive-through feature, and what you see is that the tax base is all spread out. Your return on per foot of investment goes way, way down. Your tax base becomes denuded and you lose a lot of money. Strodes are the worst investment that we can make. They're incredibly dangerous and we lose money every time we build one. And the heartbreaking thing about Tucson is that Tucson is what? 90% stroke, lots and lots and lots of these things. So when we go back to that question, how do we get more money? And I say, we need to reject that question. We need more money and I'm not arguing that we don't, but that can't be the question that we obsess about. We have to have a question of how do we make better use of what we built? How do we take what we have and actually get something out of it as opposed to just building more of it? And the answer to that question has to be to deal with this strode issue. To take our strodes and make them into great streets or really productive roads. I'm gonna tell you how to do this right now. And I'm gonna preface that by saying, it's ridiculously easy. It is really, really easy. What is hard about it is the cultural overlay we put over top of this and the expectations of our prior investments. That's the biggest burden we have. It's not a technical burden. To build a great street is easy. To build a great road is easy. Uh, the challenge we have is gonna come from us. So if we wanna go from strode to street, what do we do? The number one thing we do is we slow traffic down. You gotta have things going way, way slower than they do now. You gotta have them at neighborhood speeds. If we're gonna build a place, we have to prioritize the place. We have to prioritize people over through traffic. So people walking, people on bikes, people in transit get priority and the cars sit and wait. The cars are a lower priority in that street environment. If we're gonna build wealth in a place, we actually have to build wealth. We have to get investment there. We have to have the codes and ordinances and the regulations in place along with everything else to attract that investment and allow our neighborhoods to thicken up. We need to embrace the complexity and recognize that a street will evolve over time. You don't go to a code book and build a street. You build a street in conjunction with the stuff that's next to it. If we want to go from strode to road, it's the exact opposite, right? Uh, we're gonna, we want to speed traffic up. We want to get things moving quickly. So we have to limit access. We have to limit the things that create complexity and slow down traffic. 
we uh, have to resist the idea, or we we have we have to take our different ways of getting around and 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 separate them from each other. And I'm going to say this very clearly because I think the bike people get a little bit upset with me. There is no way as an engineer that I can build a safe bike facility on the edge of traffic that's going 35, 45, 55, 65 miles an hour. It can't be done. It just can't be done. We should have roads for bikes, no doubt. We should have people be able to get from one place to another on a bike, but that facility needs to be separated and protected from the traffic stream because it's the only way you can do it safely. We have to resist the idea that corridors are for development. Uh, you have many corridor plans. And here's how we're gonna develop this corridor. That means here's how we're gonna lose lots of money on this corridor. We have to end that. Corridors are not for development. They're for getting from one place to another very quickly. Uh, and we need to just simplify our approach. Let's go back to this. And kind of tie this all together. Because we've come up with a solution for this, right? Um, if we go back to the way we tried to solve this, how did we try to solve this originally? And, and you all kind of have benefited from this, although I, I think the clock is ticking on that, and I think everybody here probably recognizes that to one degree or another. The way we originally tried to solve this problem is we said, we're gonna go build thousands of dams. We're gonna build lots of dikes and lots of levees. And we didn't anticipate the two very human things that would happen as a result. The one very human thing that would happen is once we create a lot of safety margin by say building a dam or a levee or a dike, what do these pesky humans do? Do they keep that buffer and stay way back from it and allow that margin of safety to exist? No, they exploit that and they go right up to the edge, right? Here's the second thing that humans do. A lot of this stuff we built had 50, 75, 100 year lifespans. It needed modest amounts of maintenance along the way to keep like trees from growing in and undermining dams, to keep like little simple things from happening that would take these things out of commission. Did we do that stuff? No, we didn't do that stuff. We didn't maintain them. We now have dams that are falling apart or silted in. We, we have thousands of pending catastrophes in these systems. You, you can look at Katrina and it's fascinating because Katrina is supposedly uh, kicked off this great, um, you know, heroic uh, amount of engineering. Uh, it actually like a massive engineering failure. And the failure was not uh, necessarily in the systems that were engineered, but in their inability to recognize that humans would run these systems. And humans are flawed. You, me, all of us, collectively together. How do we solve this problem now? So we don't do it the way we did it 20, 30 years ago. How do we do it now? What we do is we go out to all these areas out here and we say things like, hey, you can't fill in your ditch. You can't run that water right into the thing. You gotta retain it on site. You gotta take care of it out here. You, 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 you can't add to the flood. That's how we solve this problem today. How do we solve this problem? Well, we're trying to solve this problem by building more lanes, building more interchanges, building more capacity, build, build, build. How do we actually solve this problem? We go out here and we say, we're gonna replace those long trips with local trips. We're gonna build neighborhoods. We're going to build places. We're going to build corner stores. And if that's your strategy, which by the way, is the economic development strategy that we need, if we're going to try to make use of the stuff we've already built, what does congestion become? Congestion goes from being our worst enemy to our greatest ally. Because what congestion does is it creates demand for local alternatives. That's the accelerant we need right now. If we're gonna do this, 
We've got to make some fundamental changes in how we build our cities. The, 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 the first thing that we need to do is we need to talk about uh, neighborhoods as places that evolve over time. Uh, at Strong Towns, we have long advocated that every neighborhood should be able to grow to the next level of development intensity by right. I know you're having this interesting debate right now about accessory dwelling units. Should they be 800 square feet? Should they be 600 square feet? Should they be, you know, th that's all like detailed nuance. I get it. You're going to struggle with that. I'm happy that you're actually having that debate. That's a healthy thing to do. But the reality is, is that every single neighborhood we have, if X is the rate of change, X needs to be greater than zero. X can never be zero. We can't lock neighborhoods uh, under glass. We can't freeze them in amber and not allow them to change. They have to grow and adapt. There's a trade-off with that. And it's a trade-off that we need to have the discipline to follow. No neighborhood should experience radical change, but no neighborhood can be exempt from change. No neighborhood uh, can say, we're not gonna have any growth, we're not gonna have any change, we're just gonna stay exactly the way we are from now until the end of time. But no neighborhood should be subjected to the types of radical transformation that we see happen so often. Where we come in and, and, and take down an entire neighborhood and reimagine it with outside money and outside capital. We create our own NIMBYs, we create our own backlash. We distort our own local markets when 95% of our community stagnates and 5% undergoes radical transformative change. What we need is incremental change over a broad area over a long, continuous period of time. As part of this, we need to systematically lower the bar of entry. We need to allow people to come in at lower price points and lower entry levels to be full participants in our society. This is something that pre-depression development patterns did really, really well. There's a lot of things they didn't do well, and I'm not suggesting we go back to horse and buggies and, and, and you know, outhouses and burn barrels, right? But there's some things that that system did really well. One of them is it welcomed new entrants into the system at low price points. For example, this is something that in my community we call a tiny house. My ancestors would have called this a house. For some reason, we have put the adjective tiny on the front of this. And then we make people go through this long convoluted process, right? If you want to build a tiny house, you have to meet all the requirements of a house house. You have to meet subpart A through M of the tiny house ordinance. You have to go beg permission from your neighbors. You have to go genuflect in front of a planning board. All to build what is really just a starter home. People for thousands of years, starting out poor and modestly, would build a small house. They would save up a little bit of money and put on an addition. They would have a kid, put on a second story. The neighbor would come over and help. They would go over and help their neighbor. This is how we built communities for millennia. For some reason, we have made this illegal today. We need to make things like this legal. We need to lower the bar of entry and allow more people to fully participate in building our places. There's a commercial analog to this as well. These are storage sheds in Muskegon, Michigan. One thing that Muskegon, Michigan, uh, sorry, recognized was that the bar of entry for people to participate uh, in the business community was too high. If you wanted to get into uh, one of the storefronts, you had to either uh, pay a, a high level of rent for a long period of time, or you were going to have to get into a rundown dilapidated building, in which case there were hundreds of thousands of dollars of building code issues you were gonna have to deal with before you could actually open up your business. And for an entrepreneur, that is a very high bar to clear. And let's be clear about what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is not the guy with a half million dollars that's gonna go start the franchise donut shop, right? That's an investor. An entrepreneur is a crazy person with an idea who doesn't recognize that they can fail. <laughs> and their idea is a way to do something that will be of service to others that they can then make a living doing. We want that type of person in our community. The amazing thing is that the greatest percentage of entrepreneurs come from the poorest people in our communities. And that's because the poor people have to be really entrepreneurial to make it through every day. 
If we want that energy to be part of our economic ecosystem, we have to lower the bar of entry. So what they did in Muskegon is they went and bought a bunch of storage sheds, they painted them up funky colors, they put them out in a gap in their streetscape, and they rent them out to startups very, very cheaply. 75 bucks a month, no long-term commitment, stay as long as you need, when you're done, you leave, we'll bring someone else in. These places are full of energy, they're full of excitement. You know what else in Muskegon is full of energy and excitement? Their core downtown. And a lot of the people in their core downtown today are people that started out here, failed, tried again, failed, tried again, failed, tried again, when the stakes were really low, figured out how to do what they were gonna do, and then graduated to a full business. We need to lower the bar of entry. The third thing we need to do to change the way we're building our places is to change our capital investment approach. When we look at local governments today, what we look in that solving the, the, the Great Depression problem is local governments have adopted the military model of organization. This is the model that came out of the Great Depression in World War II. It, it's a vertical model uh, that, that is comprised of hierarchies and silos. And those hierarchies and silos orient vertically, placing local government at the bottom of a government food chain. And if you spend any time in local government, the, the, the critique is that, well, local government's inefficient. They don't, they, they, they're, they're too bureaucratic. No, local government's ridiculously efficient. They're, that model is designed to be very, very, very efficient at bringing in inputs and delivering an output. You could not have built what you built here without a very efficient government. What it doesn't do, hierarchies and silos, is adapt, is change. It's very efficient at doing the same thing over and over. We've had 70 years of doing the same thing over and over. And so if you go to local government today, what you see is that they're very oriented around what? What is the money coming from Washington, D.C.? What is the money coming from the state capitol? What is the developer coming in with money to do the pattern? What can we get from the bond market to continue to do what we're doing? They're oriented vertically. What we need, if we're gonna make better use of the investments that we've made, is for local government to shift their orientation horizontally, to focus obsessively on the people in the community and where they struggle. Because it's focusing on those struggles that is gonna help us make better use of the investments we've already made. At Strong Towns, we've created a four-step approach to making the lowest risk, highest returning public investments that we can make. I'm gonna go through that here for you. Step number one, go out and humbly observe where people struggle. I'm gonna emphasize humility here. Go out and without any preconceived notion of what you're gonna find, what you think should happen, what the pet project you've always wanted is, Go out and try to understand where people are having a difficult time using the city as it has been built. Step number two, ask yourself a question. What is the next smallest thing that we can do right now to address this struggle? Resist the temptation to say, uh, what is the project I've always wanted to do? What is the thing we can get a grant for? We can fix this in five years when our capital improvement plan gets, no, 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 no. What is the thing that you can do right now with the materials you have on hand? How can you take some cones and some duct tape and some paint and go out and make that a little bit better? You're not trying to solve it. You're just trying to make it a little bit better. Step number three, do that thing. Do that thing right now. Do, don't form a committee. Don't study it for six months. Don't bring in a consultant. It's a small little thing. Go out and do it. And then step number four, Repeat that process over and over again. Jane Jacob called cities a co-creation, something we build together. And the best cities, the most productive places are places that we do build together. Today we have a system where we pay for government and government is delivered to us. We may be asked to come in and comment on something, deliver formal comments, maybe put stickers on a wall True co-creation means the, the, the city, the community going out and humbly observing and then taking small steps and watching how people react and then responding to that and then responding to that and then responding to that over and over and over. 
If we do that type of investment, what we find is that we can make ridiculously cheap investments with ridiculously high financial returns. We can invest in places and have them grow wealthier and more prosperous and with greater capacity than we've ever experienced. And we do it while simultaneously making people's lives better. And the miracle of this is that when we go out and we look at the places that are most productive, when we go out and look at the places that have the greatest financial return on investment, the places that are really shining uh, in terms of their productivity, they all have the same basic characteristics. They all have the same thing in common. We see the same thing everywhere we look. We see people. We see people outside of their vehicles. We see people in the space. We see people being in that space. People are, to borrow a term from ecology, the indicator species of success. I want to end with, uh, with this um, about the design process because a, a lot of what holds us back from making change is a, a, a consensus understanding of the priorities of the community. And I want to reveal to you, I want you to walk out of here tonight recognizing that your perceptions are probably wrong in that regard. When engineers go out and design a street, the street out in front of here, the street out in front of your place, there's a, there's a set process that they use. And that process uh, embodies in a sense, the values and priorities of the profession. The first thing that they will do is they will say, what is the design speed that I am building for here? How fast do I want vehicles to be able to travel? The second thing they will ask then is, what is the volume of traffic I'm expected to handle? How many cars are gonna be coming through here that my design needs to accommodate? Given that speed and that volume, they'll then go to a design manual and say, what is the safe way to build a street with these characteristics? And then how much is that going to cost? It's those four values, those four priorities, speed, volume, safety, cost, in that order that actually create the, 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 the design process and the framework, the intellectual framework or the, the, the value framework that is applied on every street project that we build. This is my street. This is where I live. This is uh, 4th Street North in Brainerd, Minnesota. Um, this is not a current shot because it's white now because it's full of snow. That's my sidewalk right there. My house is right over here off that street. I want you to think about the street where you live. Think about the place that you live. And I wanna give you an opportunity to design the street in front of your place. If you were given that opportunity, you, you, you are the one who are setting the priorities for your street in front of your place. Would you start with the design speed? Would you make sure that vehicles were able to attain a certain speed on that street? Would you start with the volume of traffic and make sure that the street could accommodate a certain amount of traffic flowing by? Would you start with safety and make sure that the street is safe in your neighborhood? Or would you start with cost to make sure that the investment was cost effective? If you were gonna prioritize, and this is the audience participation part of this, I want you to all shout out simultaneously. Would you prioritize speed, volume, safety, or cost? Cost. <laughs> None is not an option. <laughs> Carbon footprint. Come on. Cost. If you are uh, designing your street and you have to decide, do I want to make sure my traffic hits a certain volume or a certain, I'm sorry, speed? Do I want to handle a certain volume of traffic? Or am I most interested in making sure the investment is cost effective? Would you prioritize speed, volume, or cost? Cost. If you had to prioritize speed or volume, 
We can either have vehicles travel at a speed, but fewer cars will be able to get through, or more cars will get through, but we have to lower the speed. We have to bring the speed down. Would you prioritize speed or volume? Volume. Do you see what we've done here? I realize there were some extraneous comments that were not part of the selection. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm here trying to help you actually build good streets. This is the design process we use. Do you see what you did here? Do you recognize what you did? You reversed it. And do you see where speed is on both of these? Yeah. Right? Everybody is willing to sacrifice speed in order to achieve safety on their own street. Everybody is. I've done this with groups of engineers and engineers say the same thing. Engineers look at this list and engineers say, this is not how we would design. We would design like this. So many times we show up to the public meeting and we start to talk about how we're going to change a street and slow down traffic and all this and everybody gets on edge because one or two people show up and they scream and they get mad and like, I don't like it. And all of a sudden we're all afraid because we think that everybody wants to drive fast, that everybody is interested in speed. I want you to look around at everybody here and understand that almost everybody in this room said, I would prioritize safety over speed, safety over volume, safety over the metrics that we use as the default start to designing our streets. You need to assert your values. You need to not be ashamed of that. And you need to not feel like you're alone because you're all in agreement on this. There's a concept called complete streets. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna guess that many of you have heard of this and understand this. Um, complete streets is a response to kind of the despotic way that we build streets today, uh, where we just build them for through traffic and we kind of ignore everything else that goes on along them, all that complexity. And what the Complete Streets people did is they came in and they said, in order to build a, a proper street, it has to accommodate everybody in the system. It has to accommodate people who bike, people who walk, it should accommodate transit. We should have a place for everybody. Um, I remember in the, in the 1990s when I first learned about Complete Streets and I was a, a full-blown engineer then out building municipal infrastructure and my colleagues and I laughed about it. We thought it was kind of funny because streets are for moving cars. Like, why would we be doing all this other stuff? It was kind of looked at as like, you know, uh, that hippie stuff that we were being asked to do. I watched the engineering profession change though over time. And it changed for a couple of very important reasons. Because engineers generally today embrace the complete streets approach. And they embrace it because one, they get paid more to do it. There's more money in the system that goes to complete streets than not complete streets. You, you're more likely to get funding, you're more likely to get a bigger project. It's more lucrative in a sense to do a, a bigger complete streets project than one that doesn't accommodate complete streets. But the second one, and I think even more important than that, is that the complete streets approach does not require the engineer to compromise at all on the design priorities they use. It does not require them to compromise in any way on the approach of speed, volume, safety, cost. Complete Streets has an, a, an Oprah-like approach to it. You, you watch Oprah and you know, you look under your chair. Oh, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. Everybody gets a car. And in Complete Streets, everybody gets a lane, right? You're walking, you get a lane. You're biking, you get a lane. You're driving, you get a lane. It's very American concept, right? Like separate but equal kind of thing. Complete streets accommodate pedestrians within an auto-dominated realm. Huge advancement over where we've been, but not nearly where we're trying to get to. A strong town will accommodate automobiles in an environment dominated by people. It's people that build wealth. It's people that make a place successful. It's people that create prosperity. 
And when we focus on humans in the space, when we slow traffic down, when we focus on their needs, when we focus on where they struggle and we take incremental steps to make those struggles better, what we will find is that we have everything we need to build amazing places. We don't have to wait for permission. We don't have to wait for consensus. We have consensus. We don't have to wait for some big injection of funding. We have everything we need. And if we go out and do it today, we will find that we can make very low risk, low cost investments that have amazing financial return, that will build our wealth and our capacity and the capacity of our community while also improving people's lives across the board. That's the essence of a Strong Downs approach. And that's what I'm here urging you to get going on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, <laughs> this has been uh, absolutely a beautiful place to be tonight. Um, I hope you're not cold because it is perfect weather. <laughs> we're gonna take some questions. And while we're doing that, if you uh, are interested, um, I'm always like leery when I'm out on the road during member week. This is our member drive week. We're a 501c3, twice a year we do a member drive. So when I go to it, when I do an event like this, I tell people, go to our website, get connected. Uh, we publish two, three articles a day. They're all free, there's no paywall. They're for you to use, to pass around. Uh, they're all Creative Commons licensed, so you can copy and paste anything you want out of that and use it in any way that would, would benefit you and benefit this cause. Uh, we've got three different podcast streams. We do a lot of video. We're on every social media platform. Uh, so I welcome you to get connected and, and be part of our growing conversation. Um, if you go there today, you're going to get inundated with member stuff. Uh, if you want to sign up to be a member, that would be delightful. If you don't want to, come back next week. We're going to be doing Black Friday parking stuff and then uh, regular programming for the rest of the year. Uh, so please, we welcome you to be part of this international conversation. Please. Well, again, thank you. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll probably give you another hand before, uh, before <laughs> it's all, all is, good. Before all is said and done. So first of all, thank you to those who submitted questions. Uh, and there's still an opportunity to do so. Uh, Colby is in the aisle, Kylie is in the back. You can grab a note card and a pen uh, and, and submit your questions. I'm gonna quickly look through them over the next minute. And we're also going to, if you're on the live stream, we'll check uh, that, uh, that digital option as well. Uh, to, uh, to, to kick us off and to give uh, me a little time uh, to, to look through these, I want to ask this, and you had an insight that has sat with me for the last couple of weeks, okay. and I think um, uh, uh, when we had that radio show interview, and yeah. whether it's Strode's or whether it is how do we make uh, uh, our, the land that we have economically viable, you touched on housing. I think so many of the things that you touched on uh, ultimately comes back to the result uh, and the resolve of a community tension. And here's how you put it. Yeah. Um, the, the, those of us who are uh, environmentally passionate um, will say, look, to get what Chuck wants to get done, we are not going to grow horizontally. We can't do that. Yeah. And so, so many of our communities say, okay, we're gonna go inside. Right. Uh, and we get at the neighborhood level and we hear from neighbors who are passionate about the character and the culture of their neighborhood, but we're not gonna grow vertically. Right. And, and so there are, there are interests among us who don't wanna grow horizontally and then don't wanna grow vertically. Yeah. Something has to give. You said that to me and I went, right. whoa, <laughs> I feel yeah. that. Yeah. And we're all involved in those conversations. How do we resolve uh, and get to the political will, mm -hmm. Chuck, how do we resolve that tension well yeah. to get to what you talked about uh, for the last hour? It, it's a, it's, I, think, I feel like it's like the existential implementation question, right? So Tucson should never add another foot of pipe, another foot of road. You should not annex another acre of property. Like you, you literally can't maintain what you have why would you add anything more? And I don't even feel like that is a difficult conversation. It's reckless to do it. And, and I think we can just dispense with that. And so the people who are saying, I wanna stop horizontal growth, I, I am with you. The finances are with you. History will be with you. And it's just a question of how quickly that realization comes to you. But this deeper question of, okay, if we're not gonna grow out, um, but we have 
a need for more housing. We have a need for more investment. I'm going to tell you, you have a need to thicken up your neighborhoods because so much, most of your neighborhoods are not financially viable today. There's actually too much public investment in the ground and not enough private investment adjacent to it to actually support it. There's a, there's a mismatch in the ratio. Um, and that mismatch starts to show up after a generation or more uh, when that stuff needs to be maintained. And so you actually have to thicken up your neighborhood. I think doing that starts with a recognition that the people who are against the infill uh, and, and that type of development are not selfish. They're not irrational. They're not saying things that are wrong. They're looking around and looking at the way we do this stuff and they're saying, hell no, I don't want stuff that looks like that. And the reason is because what infill looks like today is not a, a, a more mature version of that neighborhood. If we go back a, a hundred years and we look at neighborhoods maturing, what we would see is that they actually were semblances of each other over generations. You could see how they, they, they grew from like adolescence, from like being a toddler to an adolescent, to a teen, to an adult. You, you can see that transformation happen and the neighborhoods would do the same thing. They would start very modestly and then they would get a little bit more intense and a little bit more intense. And you could understand how people would embrace that because the neighborhood got better with each increment. What we do is we have a neighborhood that we build. We build it to a finished state. The marketing brochure says, here's what it looks like and will always look like. Then we get out and it starts to fall apart. It be, because when you build 40 homes at a time or 400 homes at a time, 30 years later, everybody's roof fails at the same time, right? Everybody's like siding needs to be replaced at the same time. Everybody's sidewalk goes bad at the same time. And so simultaneously, this entire neighborhood starts to go into decline. Because you're building horizontally, what do the affluent people do? They move to the next like new neighborhood. And so what happens is you have poorer people trapped in neighborhoods in decline. And then we come in with regulation and we say, oh, what we need to do is tighten the grips here, not allow it uh, to change. So we're gonna you know, get really, really tight with regulation. What we need to do is do the opposite. We need to recognize that the person who has to maintain their roof can't do it on their income. They need to do what families have done for thousands of years, take that extra bedroom they have, make it into an efficiency apartment and rent it out and use that money to fix their roof. Now you've added a unit and cash flow and you've thickened up the neighborhood. But what happens is we let it stagnate till it gets so bad, then we go in, swoop in, clear it, and build the four-story apartment or the six-story condo or the, all, the, the big transformation. And then we wonder why people hate the word infill. I don't blame them. Every neighborhood has to be able to evolve in place. We should always be thinking, what is the next level of a maturity in this neighborhood look like? And how do we get to that? And that answered, uh, that answered a question of when we look at this kind, there's a question here, when we look at this, what you're talking about, how do we make sure that it uh, uh, equitably benefits uh, existing neighbors and, and neighborhoods. So thank you for doing yeah. two for well, there, Chuck. So so much of our so much of our development and the regulation part is actually, uh, I, I'm going to say, in in my city, there was this phrase that was going around for a long time. Those people, and those people in my city, our diversity is we have Finns and Swedes and Norwegians. <laughs> so you know, those people is a class thing. <laughs> Um, but it was always like those people don't have pride of place. Those people are not taking care of stuff. those people. And I, I looked and I'm like, you mean those people in that community, in that neighborhood where we don't allow them to, to do anything, where we're not fixing their streets, where we're not maintaining their stuff, where we as a city are defaulting on our promise to them. Because of course the wealthy neighborhood gets their street maintained and the poor neighborhood does not because we don't have enough to maintain both. So I, I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a covenant here that has to include the city doing their part while also allowing the neighborhood to evolve. This, I, I really like how this question was, was written. Uh, in a network that is 90% strode, yeah. how do we choose which ones to make streets and which to make roads? That's a fantastic, fantastic question. It's almost like the, the, the billion dollar question, right? Um, Here's, I think, what we have to resist. I think we have to resist choosing. I think we have to allow the choice to emerge. Um, 
I'm looking at this place here. What is this? Yeah, don't walk in front of the speaker. Um, <laughs> what, what is this place here? It, this is a bunch of, you know, uh, okay. box cars. Uh, it's some, you know, low cost fence. Uh, th this is a very low, uh, and I'm not saying this in a disparaging way because when I walked in here, my first thought was, this is freaking awesome. This is such a low value investment. It is really like an investment in place more than it is an investment in like substance, right? And the reason it's so awesome is because it's actually starting with place. When I look at this investment here, I'm so jazzed about it, not because I think that I should come back 20 years from now and see exactly this, but because what this does for me is it says, we've started with the most important thing, which is a place. And now the next question is, how do we build more and make this place better? In the triage of that 90%, I think it's important to recognize that half of that, three fourths of that is actually gonna go away. And I know that's a hard thing to get our minds around. I say it and it sounds like I'm just trying to be shocking. No, you actually are gonna say goodbye to a huge portion of those strodes. And so the idea that you would go out and choose which one would be streets and which one would be roads, like, you know, we're Nero at the, at the, mm -hmm. at the Coliseum. Um, no, what's gonna happen is that success will emerge and then you support that success. So I look at this place and I see like a budding success. This is not a finished product. This is not an end state. This is a great initial investment in place. Now I go out and I say, I wanna fix all the streets around this. I wanna make the streets around this awesome. And I wanna connect them to everything around here because I want the energy from this place to start to flow out and connect to that. And I see what happens. And I ask, how are people in this neighborhood struggling? How do they struggle to get here? How do they struggle to get to the next increment of intensity in this area around here? That's how I do it. So I don't choose, I follow. I allow it to emerge and then I, I, I build on that. I think we have time for two more questions All right. and then you'll be around as well in yes, the back. Yes, I'm gonna go in um, the back and I hope we, we, there's a local bookstore here that is selling books, so let's support them and, and that would be awesome. Uh, here's another really interesting question, and I think the Tucson history is there were multiple times when uh, it was brought forward to the Tucson voters in some way uh, to do a, an east-west freeway, and I'm sure to some yeah. point also look at faster north-south. And right. each time uh, Tucsonans said no, right. and what we have now is a, a is a is a highway, a freeway that goes around the outside. Uh, of our city, uh, but this uh, person asked, because Tucson built its highway on the far west side of town, how do we now correctly connect the city east to west, north to south? We don't really have that. What's the best way now, kind of built up to where we are gonna be, how do we do that? I, I think that if I sat here and and, you know, talked with you for days about the challenges that you face and then we ranked all those challenges i i don't see that one being like in the top 100 you know like i, I don't know as i would spend a lot of time on that yeah you know, how, how do you connect this far-flung wide space how do you connect it all together I, i'm i wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over that to, I, what i would obsess about is where are the neighborhoods gonna form in this mass? You know, you, you've got this big mass of stuff that's kind of spread out and denuded. Where are the neighborhoods gonna form and how do we connect those neighborhoods together? You've got a neighborhood in the downtown. Where are your other neighborhoods going to spring up and how do you connect those? And maybe those would have an east-west orientation to them. Maybe they'd have a north-south orientation to them. The interstate is about connecting you to neighboring cities quickly and the outside world quickly. And that's the value they have. So when you put interchanges along those, when you mess those up and make them congested, you're just wrecking your capacity to interact with the outside world. But internally, it, it provides you very modest benefits to be able to drive across the entire region very quickly. It provides you way more benefits today to start building neighborhoods and places. 
And so I, 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 I get that that's a concern. It would not be my concern. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Statistically, and there was a major Gallup survey done in Arizona, Tucsonans hate their roads more than anybody else anywhere else. <laughs> Statistically, it's yeah. an actual data point. And so we talk about our roads a lot, as, as you can yeah. as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, what is your, I love this question too, and this might be our last one. If it is, it's a good one. Okay. What is your advice on working within the established system to implement the strong towns approach as opposed to, and this is whoever wrote this, their words, yeah. as opposed to being a radical activist, yeah. criticizing the system from the outside? Yeah, it's a great, it's a fantastic question. And let me answer it in, in two ways. Um, I think the radical activist is really important. Um, we uh, at Strong Towns have started a program and are actually launching an expanded version called Local Conversations um, to, to help those kind of lone activists get connected to other people and become more effective. The, the most, <laughs> I'll say this as a guy who started a blog and then now am, am part of this like international movement. Um, the most ineffective thing is one lone person. Like it really is. He, 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 the biggest advice we give to people who has that like lone dissenter or, or angry voice is you have to find other people who are with you and start building a group of people. Uh, if, if you, <laughs> I told this to my neighborhood, uh, we, we've got a neighborhood group and I said, if you show up at the neighborhood group and say, hey, I'm Krista from the, you know, I'm Krista, here's my address, they'll listen to you but if you say, I'm Krista, I'm with the North Brainerd Alliance, they'll be like, whoa, okay, who's that? And even though it's the same person with like one other person with them, it, it has like this connotation of, of, of a group. We gotta form groups and groups can influence and groups can get people to things and groups can stay on top of things and focus on issues and help basically expand the conversation in ways that you can't from inside. That being said, inside, uh, the entire book that, that we just put out is designed to let people who are in the system and frustrated with how it works know that they have way more power than they think they have. Uh, a lot of times we have accepted the systems that have been given to us and we've said, you know, here's how things work, the engineer will decide this and that. The reality is, is that in most investments that we make and most transportation systems that we do, a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of it is technical work that requires a professional engineering license. The vast majority of it is stuff that we should be doing ourselves. To determine whether something is a road or a street is not a technical decision. It is a value-based decision. It's a community decision. Um, and so we should not defer that decision to somebody else. Uh, there are so many things in that list and so I, I want people to walk out of here. That's why we end with the, 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 the value thing, the speed, volume, safety, cost thing, because I want people to walk out of here recognizing that they have way more power and authority to make decisions than they think that they do. Uh, you don't have to be on a committee. You don't have to run for office. You don't have to be on a planning commission. But if you are one of those things, understand and recognize that you have far more power and authority than you ever have shown willingness to exercise. We all are deferring in ways that we don't need to. Chuck, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Let's give uh, Chuck Marone a hand. Um, and I, I'd love to pick your brain for another hour, yeah. um, but um, in this form, we'll put a pin in it. But you do have a couple of books uh, I got two back books. there, Chuck. Uh, we're here tonight mainly because you just put out one called yes. Confessions of a Recovering Engineer, and it's very transportation focused. Um, and I need to pick that one up. I do have your first one, though. Oh, yeah. Uh, Strong Towns, a bottom up revolution to rebuild American prosperity. And that broadly talks about some of the things that you hinted at around housing and economic vitality. You have both books back there, and I certainly yes. would encourage everyone to come and say hi and to get a book. and all of that. So. And tomorrow morning, right? And tomorrow morning. So I've got 30 more seconds of housekeeping. Okay, good. You do then, it. And, and then, then we'll cut every, and then I we'll think, cut I think what I'm excited about here is I get to do not this presentation, but a yes. different one yes. tomorrow. So my understanding, uh, Chuck, is that tomorrow was so popular that it's fully registered. Oh, is for. it really? However, <laughs> we have a live stream link. Uh, okay. So go to strontownstucson.com. 
and you can uh, get that live stream tomorrow. You can see when it is, it's at the University of Arizona, uh, and you can register for that live stream link. Uh, a recording of this presentation will be available to watch on the MSA YouTube account, so you can go and check that out. And uh, if you registered for this event, you'll get that in a follow-up email as well. So you'll have a recording of tonight. You can still log in to the live stream uh, tomorrow. And uh, I think that's about it, Chuck. Other awesome. than, I want to again thank our sponsors and thank the team. I work directly with Kylie and Ryan.